Hi, Dominic. Hello, Peter. Thank you for doing this. Like, okay, let me set this up. Um, I've done this once before where I've asked someone to interview me, which is a little bit, um, well, it's a bit weird because it's my show, but I do, I want to tell the story of the football club to everyone on the podcast. And I thought you'd be one of the best people to do it. You're English, you understand football, you understand Bitcoin. Um, and I don't want to abuse the podcast for the football club. I want to get it out there and then want to get back on with the show. But I, I do want to leverage it a bit and, you know, everyone listening, hopefully we'll go and check it out and support what we're doing. So thanks for doing this. Over to you. My pleasure. And I would say you can say you're leveraging the podcast or leveraging the podcast, but it's a fantastic story. And one of the things you've done on the podcast is give a platform to fantastic stories. And it is an, a huge development for Bitcoin, I think, as well, assuming it all goes well with the club. Um, but I guess the place to start is, as always, at the very beginning. <laughs> and you tried to buy, you're from Bedford, as we all yep. know, and you tried to buy Bedford Town. Yeah. And okay. that didn't work. Do you, should we start with that? Yeah, that was always the goal. Actually, um, I've got a chief executive working with me now, a good old friend called Tom Pattinson. Um, I know Tom Pattinson. Oh, you do? Don't No, no, you know a different Tom Pattinson. We've had this conversation before. Okay. Let's, it's let's, a different Tom Pattinson. Okay. But my Tom Pattinson, you would like. I think you would get on really well with him. And, you know, we should, uh, we should get together at some point because he's a great guy. But about four years ago, during the 2017 ball run, I knew the current chairman that time wanted to let the club go. He wasn't willing to invest. And we started doing some initial research into buying them. And I realized I can't afford this. I can't make this work. Um, and it's something I've wanted to do since I was about, yeah, let me speak to my dad since I was a kid. I've been saying to him and I was used to say to my mum, um, I'd like to buy the Bedford team. And, and so what happened was it was only this year I kind of realized like, actually, I think I know how to do this. And it, it's about... It's not about me doing it on my own. It's about leveraging Bitcoin and leveraging the podcast. Um, so what happened was I approached Bever Town and uh, approached the chairman and said I was interested in acquiring the club. Here's my plan. Here's my strategy. And, you know, we tried to get to a deal. Couldn't get to one, sadly. Uh, sadly for me, but, you know, they've, he's done a great job. They're at the top of the league in, uh, in the eighth tier. And, and uh, you know, he wants to finish his project on. And, you know, I wish him the best of luck because he's done a great job there. And, they should get promoted and they should go into the seventh uh, tier. And um, but I didn't. It wasn't any reason for me not to do this. You know, I, I'm, I've got a guy working uh, as a consultant from a top Premier League club, and he said, "Well, there's another club, Bedford FC, which uh, might be available. Why don't you try and buy them?" So I approached the chairman. Had you even heard of them? Had I? Yeah, no, I knew of them because they were next door to Bedford Town. Okay. I just hadn't considered them. Are they just a you know sort of one up from a park team? Yeah, they're a 10th tier. You know, on a good day, they'll get 100 people come and watch them. And on a bad day, a couple of men and a dog, as we say. Okay. Statement. But I just hadn't thought about them. Um, and did you grow up supporting Bedford Town or were they too sort of low down the league? I didn't even, when I was a kid, I didn't know they existed. Okay. I went to school, supported Liverpool, a bit like yourself. Um, so what team would most people from Bedford support? Luton or someone? Uh, if you want to support a local team, it's Luton. Yeah. Tom, Tom's a Luton fan. He was there on Saturday. Um, but when you would go to school, it was Man U, Liverpool, Arsenal. Mm -hmm. No, no it wasn't City or Chelsea at those no. days. It was just those three. Some Tottenham fans. And then you'd have the odd random one, like a Burnley fan. And then a handful of Luton fans. Uh, no Watford fans, even though we're not far. Um, and there are some MK Dons fans now because they're nearby. But it's really, it was Luton or one of the top mm -hmm. teams. Um, and Luton were a top team for a bit. Luton were a top team for a bit, yeah. And I mean, David Pleat. The first time, it wasn't the first game. The first game I ever went to, my dad took me to a playoff game actually at Watford because my dad's a Blackburn fan. So I went to Blackburn v Watford. But my first Liverpool game, my first two Liverpool games were at uh, Kenilworth Road when they used to have the plastic pitch. Yeah. Yeah, we uh, first game we lost 3-1, uh, but I got to see my hero John Barnes play, which was amazing. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then it was a nil-nil draw the following year. I might have them the, the wrong way around, but it was a 3-1 defeat and a nil-nil nil draw. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was only when do I... Do you follow John Barnes on Twitter? I do. Yeah. Yeah, he's uh, he's on a specific... He's on he's on a one-track Twitter. One-track, <laughs> yeah, one-track. Yeah. I saw him actually at Watford recently. I mean, I love the guy. Yeah, what a player. Yeah, unbelievable. Um, he, yeah, my, when I was a kid, funnily enough, he, he yeah, my mum, I wanted a Liverpool teddy, and uh, she wanted to get me one of the ones, but I said I wanted the John Barnes one, so she made me one. 
It's actually the John Barnes teddy that she made. A bespoke John. Bespoke John Barnes. You should sell that as an NFT. Yeah, well, I don't have it anymore. I, I don't know where I got rid of it. It's probably in the loft at my parents somewhere. But uh, but yeah, anyway, so what happened was went away to uni, came back, and then I would go and watch Bedford Town very occasionally. But it was it was a crap experience. And, and you know, some people were listening. It was like, well, you don't understand non-league football. You've got to support that. And they're right. But I didn't. Um, but I always felt like Bedford could support a league club. You know, we're a population of 174,000 people. Uh, we've never had a league club uh, for people listening. If places like Blackburn and Wigan can, then Bedford certainly can. Well, Burnley's a population of 90,000. Mm. They've got a Premier Bolton. League team. And I'm, yeah, but, and they've got a lot of competition in there. Mm. We've got very little competition. And, um, but we've never had a league club. And just for people listening, because there'll be Americans who won't understand this, uh, you know, the league is four tiers of football Premier League, Championship League One, League Two. I think we can support a league club as in League Two minimum. Um, so yeah, I, I want I wanted to do it. I always felt it could support it. I just so I approached Bedford Town, but they didn't want to do it. So here we are. I've agreed on a deal for Bedford FC. And uh, may I ask, how much did you buy Bedford FC for, and who did you buy it from? Uh, I can answer one of those. I can. Uh, it's a guy called Louis de Mauro, who's a great guy. He's run the club for the last twenty years. You know. To the point whereby, like, not only is he chairman, he uh, mows the lawn and marks the pitch out and does a lot. He's done a great job there. Um, just for the interest of him, you know, I agreed just to keep the the, the price, price okay. yeah, price confidential, just because you know he doesn't want people. And will you give him a job? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, it's whether I wonder what you know, because it's a big thing to give over. It's a big part of his life. I wonder whether. He wants, like, like, how he feels about letting go. He's probably never, you know, he's never really told me. I mean, he'll always be welcome there. Um, you know, I'd love to, um, you know, recognize the work that he's done within the club. And he's he's a friend of the club and he's a friend of mine now and, you know, permanently welcome. I just imagine handing over is going to be a tricky thing because he's probably going to see me make decisions that he won't agree with or won't like and, but nosy, I have to go and you know mm -hmm. figure my own journey out. But um, he's a really great guy, and he has kept that club going for twenty years with zero budget. Okay, and <clears throat> are we allowed to know what the current running costs are? I mean, the current running cost is about fifteen thousand pound a year pre myself. Uh, I are the say players pay? Sorry, are the players paid? <laughs> yeah, uh, no, no, none of the pay players are paid, but. This is, uh, I was with uh, Tom two days ago and we wrote our budget and we've done an 18 month budget because through to the end of this season until the end of next season. So we've run in it as an 18 month budget and I've put in a budget of 300,000 uh, pound of which, hold on, let me tell you, I think I've been in a 2,000 pound a week budget for the playing team next season. So if you think, I mean, that's about 40 weeks it's about 80,000 plus the rest of this season. I've given the managers a thousand pound a week budget for the rest of the season. Uh, but we've put in budget for lots of things, so upgrading equipment, getting a, a new bibs. New bibs. I bought some new bibs yesterday. <laughs> got them coming today. Uh, new balls, bibs, training ladders. We've got to put in place software. We've got to get a groundsman in. All the things they've not had, we're putting in place. Okay, so what division are you currently in? We are in the Spartan South Midlands Div. One and are there paid players in the Spartans South Midland one? There will be some, um, maybe on fifty quid a week. Okay, and do you like to have a player to sign a player? Do they have to sign some kind of? Do they have to join the club? Do they have to sign some kind of contract? Can you have any old Joe playing for you? You can really sign any. I mean, there's rules on approaching players who are already at clubs, mm -hmm. but you don't actually have to sign a contract. I mean, we've got we've just signed three players. And, to, and a couple of other players are going to be put on a uh, fee, a match fee. We don't have to sign contracts with them. But if you want to sign somebody who's already at a club, you've got to put in a seven-day notice. So you approach the, t the team, you say, we want to talk to so-and-so. Uh, they have to inform the player uh, and they make a decision whether they can talk to you or not. If they say no, you have to wait seven days. If they say yes, you can speak straight away. But you have to follow those procedures. Okay. Um what what's the division above you? It's uh, it's the prem. 
So South, Spartan South Midlands Prem. Okay, and is it too late for you? Where are you in the table at the moment? No, well, that's why I've given the, the current managers a budget. So we are eighth in the table. Top two go up? Yeah, so, well, first, and then uh, two to five going to playoffs. Okay. So we could definitely make the playoffs, absolutely make the playoffs, and I want to, but I've said to the management, I said, listen, everything this season's a bonus. The remit from essentially next season is promotion, which is a remit given to my chief executive, given to my sporting director, given to my management team. The remit is promotion. You have to tell me everything you need to give yourself the best chance, whether that's players, whether that's equipment, whether that's uh, match day facilities, whether training facilities. You tell me what you need and we will give you everything we can to try and make that happen. But the remit is promotion next season. And the remit will be promotion every season. When did you take the club over? January the first. Well, so we've not we've not completely taken over because we've got we you know um, we agreed the deal just prior to Christmas. Lawyers took Christmas off, so we're just waiting for a contract okay. to be signed. So we have not taken over the club, but we are. I'm Your support- tentacles are already. Yeah, so I'm supporting in the running of the club. I'm providing equipment and facilities, but the club is still being run by the same team at the moment but we're just supporting it okay now i um my son when he was about five that that kind of period five to eight um in his class uh there was a boy who he became sort of best friends with and the boy's dad was a former player um by the name of carl hutchinson and carl had played a couple of games for chelsea and then he was he was a real proper journeyman pro from south london i think he had a long quite a long career at um bristol city Okay. You know, so mm-hmm. second, third division kind of journeyman player. And I've played football with him a few times and, you know, he's just so much better than me. You played? I, I, only, I, I still play now. I'm 52. I'm going, when I finish this, I'm going off to play. Nice. Um, but, uh, you know, it's old man's six side that I play now, but, but I, you know, I love it. And I used to play with Carl and he would do, Carl became an agent and so he would train players and I'd go and train, you know, pre-season with some of his players. And there was, you know, proper they were just so much better than me, but he always said I was Beresi at the back. Anyway, but what Carl used to do um, when he was in his sort of mid to late 30s is he didn't have a contract uh, with any particular club. And he just effectively came a freelance player. And I think he would go and play for like Tooting and Mitcham or one of those kind of South London teams. And he'd just get a little brown envelope at the end of the game with three or 400 quid or whatever the match fee was in the envelope. Maybe it wasn't even as much as that. And there are a lot of players who you know they're 32 33 the clubs decide their careers over they let them go but they're still you know pretty good players yeah and i imagine if you you know put the feelers out you could find three or four guys like that you know a center back a midfield and a striker maybe a goalkeeper and that would be, I don't know any of the Bedford players, so I don't know how good mm-hmm. or bad they are, but do you know what I mean? The spine of a team. The spine of a team. And, yeah. and that might be, you know, pay a little bit more and that might, you know, get you up. So one of the things that's really interesting is the amount of things I've learned in the first few weeks about football. And I'm continuing to learn and understanding what I don't know. Um, I'm not getting involved in player signings or or obviously I'm not getting involved in team selection because I know nothing about that. And I'm, you know, I'm giving that as the remit to my managers. You know, you're the managers, your job's against promotion. It's the guy who's the manager. Are you changing manager or are you sticking with the same guy? Well, I, we've changed manager already. Okay. Um, so the managers, your remit is uh, this season to try and get the playoffs. Do your best. And if you get us in the playoffs, we get promoted. There's a bonus. I've awarded, and there's bonuses throughout the team. And everything's paid in Bitcoin? No. Okay. <clears throat> we'll, come, we'll come back to that. Okay, sure. um, But it's to, you know, the players have got, a, they've got a win bonus, which they haven't had before. You know, mm-hmm. they get a certain amount each game if they win. I actually gave it on the last game, which was the draw, just because they they came, when we took over, there was, uh, well, when we And are the players like the postman, the, the guy, the local chippy, the local sparky and all that? Yeah, a little bit, but I mean, there's a range. There's yeah. a range of people. Um, but the, once we announced that we'd agreed the deal, the next game we lost 6-1. <laughs> I which is typical. I know, yeah. It's just like, ah, oh, for fuck's sake. But like, I, I'm not... To, to a good team or... Yeah, to a decent team. Yeah. Um, you know, whatever the reason. And then, so, the next one was a tough game against Amptil. Um, above us in the table, good team, away game, big turnout, 300 people. 
and uh, they pulled out a draw and they could have won it. And I was just, I was really kind of proud of them for pulling that off. So I said, I'm going to give you your Wimbo in this, even though it's a draw and, you know, keep plugging away. Um, but yeah, so what, what I've learned is, um, you know, give it to the managers. You guys go and do this. Mm-hmm. You're in charge. And if you get us up, there's a, there's a bonus but. So who is your manager? Uh, Nathan Abbey, and he is supported, his assistant manager is Gavin Hoyt, who used to manage the team um, a couple of years ago. And uh, But one of the things I've, I'm starting to learn is there's, a, there's teams that you can have per division that suit the division you're in. Okay. So, for example, you, might, you could have a relationship with a Premier League club, say Crystal Palace, and say, can we get players on loan? And they might have the best, like, nippy winger he's going to get lumps kicked out of him in this division because it's it's a different style of football. Yeah. So you've got to you've got to understand the style of football for your division. I watched the whole Salford uh, documentary. Okay. Watched, I've been watched it over the weekend. And what was really interesting there is the managers did a really great job. Three promotions in four seasons and the one that didn't go up, they got in the playoffs. And this, the final season where they had got promoted, they still let them go. Because I think what they realised is that man, those managers had reached the limit of what they were going to be able to achieve at that point. Now, I think it was unfair to let them go, mm-hmm. but I can see why those decisions are made. And I think it's the same with players. You've got to find the players for your division that suit your division, and you've got to find the managers that suit your division. Yeah. I'm going to I'm gonna just put a contrarian point of view here. Yeah. And I'm just, this is speaking, as, you know, I, I, I'm a comedian as well. Yeah. And um, this is something I've seen with comedy, is like you'll go and you'll play a room and you'll see the room and you'll go, right, this is a really beery, rowdy crowd. I need to put on my laddish hat here and be one of the lads and get play the room this way, this way. And then another week you might go and have an art do a gig at an art house center and you're like, okay, I'm gonna do my highbrow arty material. Now the guy who only sees you, you know, the agent or the booker from the telly, he comes to the laddie club and he's looking for art house acts and he only sees you doing your laddish material, he's gonna go, well, that guy's, you know you know, a beery laddie acts and he swears and I can't have him doing, do you see what I mean? Yeah, no, I understand. So sometimes you can be almost a victim of your own versatility. Yeah. And and I've certainly, you know, I find it incredibly frustrating when other people are making decisions about you when they don't know what you're capable as much as you know what you're capable of. That's fair. Yeah, I understand where you're going with that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but that's, that's all part of the game. You've got to make decisions and has this guy got what it takes? Has he not got what it takes? Well, I... The conclusion I've come to... I guess you've got to say to him, look, if you get us up, you've got the job next season. If you get us up, you've got the job next season. I don't know. Yeah, and who's to... You know, Salford got rid of those guys. Who's to say they wouldn't have still got promotion again? I mean, who's to say... You know, when I started a podcast, I didn't know anything about podcasting, and now I'm, that's my career and it's my job. So who's to say they can't figure mm. it out? Um, but I think what I've realised... I saw it with Fulham, who I'm sort of part supporter yeah. of. They got promoted... And they didn't stick with the players who got them up. They got a whole of new players in and went straight back down again. <laughs> yeah, well. Uh, but I think, I, I think what I've come to the conclusion is, you know, as a chairman, I've got two main roles. Mm-hmm. Role number one is profit. You know, what do I drive commercially in this football team, which is a business? Let's be honest. Every football team is a business. How do I maximize the commercial opportunity to give us the best resources available for the team, the club, and also building out stuff for the community. You know, a football club is part of the community. And the second job is hiring and firing of a manager, really. You know, get the best manager for the job, trust them, give them what they need, and if they, aren't, if they don't achieve, then get rid of them and get the next one in. I think that's, that's the main two roles of a chairman. And Reading a very good book at the moment called The Psychology of Money by a chap called Morgan Housel. I can't recommend it enough. Okay. But he talks about, what's the famous Canadian or um, uh, American oil ty- tycoon? Va- um, okay, so the great oil tycoon at the end of the um, 1900s, the beginning, uh, end, of the, um, uh, 80, uh, end, end of the 19th century. You'd think as an oil tycoon, he should have known about, he was famously quiet and reclusive and didn't talk to anyone. And he was famous every time he went into a meeting, he didn't say anything. Mm -hmm. And it turned out that what he recognized about his job was he wasn't the guy in charge of drilling or exploration or, or trucking or whatever it was. His job was just to think and make, get, make decisions and get the decisions right. And I guess that's, there's a parallel with you there. That's, you've just got to think 
absorb all the information and make the right decisions. Yeah, I mean, look, what's my main skills? It's communication, sales, and marketing. So what am I going to do? I'm brand the club and market the club out to fans. I'm going to focus on the commercials for the sponsors. I'm going to focus on the commercials of the merchandise sales and you know build up a company. And, and I think that's going to bother some people, Dominic. I think some people are going to be like, oh, you don't understand football. A football club's more than a company, but sure. But it is a company. Let's, let's come to this now because the football clubs <laughs> in the UK were born, in fact, probably all over the world. They were born, you know, it would be a local club and it would be the young bucks of the area yep. representing that area. You know, so you'd have the young bucks of Bedford playing against the young bucks of Luton, playing against the young bucks of Liverpool, against the young bucks of Manchester, whatever it is. And, you know, as the game has grown and it's got, um, you know, incredibly commercialised, a lot of clubs have lost touch with their community and there are no longer any people, like, I mean, how many people from, you know, Hyber and Islington play for Arsenal? I Very few, I think. And, you know, and... Even clubs like Liverpool, which are historically very close to their community, I think there's only Trent, Trent, yeah, who, Trent, who's actually from Liverpool, and you know there's two big forces there. On the one hand, I understand why a lot of traditionalists will go, "We want local players," we you know, we've got the local bond, um, and so you know, a local player will be betrayed when they get you know. Johnny central midfield from Real Madrid to come and play central midfield and he's lost the gig in central midfield when it means that much more to him to play centre midfield than it does from the bloke from Madrid. So I understand that side of it. And then on the other side, we want to win the league. Mm -hmm. And to win the league, we have to have the best players from the world and the best managers from the world and so on and so forth. So there's two sort of contrarian forces there. The point is, is that the clubs were born out of their communities. Mm -hmm. Now, we're now obviously with the internet we have a whole new type of digital community. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so people congregate on the internet where they share, when they have shared ideas or shared goals or shared experiences, rather than necessarily a shared location of origin. And what you're doing with Bedford in making it the Bitcoin team, it's you're, you're making, you're, you're birthing the club, if you like, in a digital community rather yep. than a local community. Yes, but I'm doing both. Actually. You're actually yeah. you're doing both. Yeah, you I'm doing, doing both. both. And I'm really conscious of that. that. You know, this doesn't work with only one. You know, if we have this digital international community that supports the club because they support Bitcoin, but no, no one coming to watch it, you, you don't want to get into the league and not, you know, have, you want a few thousand people there. Absolutely. And it definitely doesn't work without the international uh, support that I've got behind this. Um, and I'm kind of lucky, Dominic, in that, so, uh, let me just clarify. I yeah. wasn't saying that you're not doing it locally, oh, no, but, but you're creating saying, yeah. a whole new digital yeah. community on the top of it. But I'm, I'm really lucky because there's three, three or four things in my life that, like the important things in my life outside of family and traditional you know, answers, in that Bitcoin, because that's my job, football, because I probably watch at least a game every two days, mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, Bedford. Like I, anyone who's been listening to my podcast is follows me on Twitter, I talk about Bedford all the time. Yeah, you've certainly big up Bedford. Well, because you know what it is? It is my town. It's where I grew up and it's where my family uh, grew up and it's where my friends are and it's where I live. And it's really easy, as especially as a British person, or anyone really from your town, to go, they're like, where are you from? It's really easy to go, yeah, I'm from Bedford. It's fucking shit. Yeah. And, and they, a lot of people do it. And I'm like, yeah, it's got its bad aspects, but it's also got its good, it's good aspects and it's got a beautiful river. And it's got beautiful parts. It's got one of the best parts I've ever been in. Um, and I like the people. I like the fact that I can I can go go from my house. I can walk through town to this pub I always go to called the Embankment, and I'll see at least five to ten people I know. And I love that. But it is a deprived area. You know, we don't have a lot of successful industry there. A lot has moved away. You know, we did have some. And it's got that London satellite town yeah. shithole thing to it, hasn't it? It has. It's now got that. Because uh, we've got a good connection to the M1, we're right on the M1 junction 13, half you know, near enough to London, but can connect to the north. That we've got uh, down all the bypasses. We've just got the big distribution centres coming, which are I understand what they're about, but the, you know, you know soulless. The soulless, you know. I was just talking about this on a previous interview with Ben, talking about Amazon and 
I'm going to try and do a month of not using Amazon because I realize they're a fucking horrible business who've destroyed local businesses and the soul of people who work there. Um, but it's a deprived town and we don't have a lot of big industry. We've got some you know, good people from there. John Oliver is from Bedford. Yeah, is he? Yeah. yeah. I know uh, John. You know John? Ah. Ah. Yeah, I'll, oh. I'll, I'll, I'll message him. Okay, great. Well, John's from Bedford. Yeah. Um, he, John yeah. and I used to play football together. Did you? Enough. Yeah, he's very good. Very good left footer. He's got a very sweet left foot. He's another Liverpool fan. Yeah. Win, uh, a bit weak in the challenge. A bit weak in the challenge. <laughs> Paul, Paula Radcliffe's from Bedford. Okay. Marathon runner. Um, but yeah, so but we don't have a lot going for it and we don't have a lot of investment. And he'll love this. I know he'll love this. It's funny you should say that because he's the one person I want to go and have a chat with and you know, get him to get behind it because I think he can well, support it. I've got his email. Okay. And, I, and he sponsored my uh, Bitcoin book and really? my um, Life After the State. But I'm, I haven't spoken to him in like five or six years, so I'm not sure that the email is still functioning. Well, we can try. <laughs> but I can certainly message him. Well, I'm going to be in LA soon, so I'd love to meet him just yeah. for coffee. Okay. I think uh, he's based in New York. I don't know. Oh, I I'm very, I, every time I do Edinburgh, I share a flat with Andy Zaltzman, who, and Andy Zaltzman and John were like, they did the bugle together and all that. They sort of started out together. I'm sure you two can connect again somehow. Uh, yeah. Well, okay, we'll talk about that. Yeah. But yeah, so like, these are the three things, biggest things in my life. The only other thing is music. I'm a big heavy metal fan. But these three things, things I can make, come together. Actually, four, four things, because I'm, I'm obviously, once we get a PA system, I'm going to be blasting ACDC as the players come out. Uh, you know, and people have said, oh, why have you got Skull and Crossbones as a logo? Apart from Skulls, of course, you know, I've got one on my hand. It's... it's I like heavy metal, so that's a touch to it. But it's cool. It's the pirates. It's the Bitcoin pirates and all that. It's cool. Yeah, but I've got these things I can bring together, Dominic. At the same time, I can support my town. I can do something really cool for my town. If we can get league football to Bedford, what a cool thing to oh, do for I my say. town! And it brings economic opportunity because you bring fans in, spending money. You can grow grassroots football, so that's cool. But I can also do a really good thing for Bitcoin because we're going to run a Bitcoin standard, and I can help educate people about Bitcoin, and I can also prove the business case of why this works. And um, and obviously football is my passion, one of my passions and loves, but I get to bring these all together. I, get, I can bring these together, but they're also blessing me with an opportunity to do this in a way that wouldn't have been possible. All three had just come together at the same time. And yeah, then, well, so I just saw, to throw that yeah. in, one other thing is, is I knew I had to be the first. Like if somebody else did this before me, I'd missed it. It had to be the first one to do it. And in doing so, I've captured... Bedford as the as the Bitcoin team, and it's a bit like I've talked about this before. But Michael Saylor talks about building a hundred year company. Yeah, you know, we don't have a long history like uh, we weren't born in you know eighteen eighty six. You know, I want to build the hundred year football club. When was the, ta- the the club born? It was about fifty years ago. You know, I should know that, but I don't know their full history. Uh, and it's funny enough, I've got a coffee soon with the one guy. There's one guy who turns up with his black and white scarf every game. I've got a coffee with him soon. He's going to tell me the full history. But uh, a year and a half ago, no one had really heard of MicroStrategy. Mm. And no one knew of Michael Saylor. Now, every CEO in the world knows MicroStrategy and they know Michael Saylor. And they know what they're up to. It was the same with El Salvador. Most people couldn't point to El Salvador mm. on a map. I certainly didn't know who Bikeli was. Now they do. Now they know what they're up to. And Bedford, for me, is the micro-strategy, the El Salvador of sports, and everyone will know who Bedford is when we do this. Everyone's going to have heard of us. And hopefully if we get this right, other teams will do it as well. Um, what's You know, like Man United's nickname is the Red Devils or Chelsea's the Blues or Everton <laughs> is the Toffeeman or Northampton's the Cobblers, whatever it is. Yeah. You got your nickname? Not yet. Do you know what's funny? What? If When I tell you the name... Of the the current team, Bev, current team Bedford FC, the one we've acquired, you're going to crack up. They're called the Printers. Why is that? Oh, uh, back to uh, a printing press. Uh, okay. Like, yeah, but, you know, the, it used to be a printing centre, presumably. Well, I think I think it's the again. That's another the, thing that, that, that a lot of clubs came into existence because of local industry. Yeah, and they would. Yeah, I think uh, again, this is why I'm meeting up with Paul the the old fan, to talk about all this. He's, you know, we've got... The this Printers coffee. is great, isn't it? Isn't the irony that yeah. they're called the Printers? And so there's this, like, dilemma. Do we keep that because it's like... Or do we change it? And, you know, what what if we change it, what would it be? Somebody's, Maximalists. We, yeah, you got you got to get it to... you got to get it to work, though. Would it be I the think, Maxis? I think, I, I think the Bitcoiners. Mi- the Miners. 
the I think the Bitcoin is. I kind of like the wizards because you know that magic internet money wizard guy. Mm -hmm. I kind of like that being our mascot and having a guy running up and down the pitch <laughs> as the wizard. <laughs> Come join us, magic internet money. Uh, the uh, honey badgers is one. Honey badgers is cool. Yeah, the cyber hornets. The problem with the cyber hornets is cool. The problem with high cyber hornets is really cool. The problem with honey badgers. John Matone has coined that term, honey badger, yeah. but it doesn't mean anything to the English. No. Because it, we don't have honey badgers. But I just like the idea of our mascot being uh, the badgers is cool. By the way, have you ever seen that Twitter account, uh, mascot minute silence? No. I got to show you after this. So it's at the football matches whenever there's a minute silence. But what they do, they show that all the players did that, and then the mascot with them, and it's the weirdest Twitter account. But I do like the idea of having this like wizard every game running That's up and down. So, so that the other the other great wizard is obviously the wizard at the end of the Wizard of Oz. Because um, you know the Wizard of Oz is an allegory. Uh, the Yellow Brick Road is the gold standard. Did you know this? I did not know this. Yeah, so the Yellow Brick Road is the gold. And in the original book, she huh. had silver slippers. They, they changed it to ruby slippers because of Technicolor, but she had silver slippers, and it was the relationship between silver and gold. And the straw man is agriculture, and the tin man is um, industry, and the lion is, is um, the, the, the military. And Oz, O-Z, is obviously an ounce as in an ounce of gold. Huh. And then he pulls back the Emerald Curtain and there's nothing there. And that's that's the sort of the whole allegory of The Wizard of Oz. Oh, I'm going to have to watch that again now. Yeah. Well, the, it's sort of, it, the book's not actually that good and the film is obviously amazing. Yeah, the film's incredible. But but the film's lost a bit of the allegory. But once you once you know the allegory, you'll, you'll see it again. Which one's the one that had the wheelers? Was that The Return to Oz? I don't know. Yeah. I don't okay. know. And I think the Wicked Witch of the North, or whichever one it was, is the, was the evil bankers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to go back to that. But, but yeah, no. Yeah, so, but so when there's nothing there behind the curtain, the, the, you know, the Emerald Wizard, and there's nothing there, um, you could incorporate that into your magic internet, internet money. wizard money man. I do like the idea of getting that made as an outfit, though, and somebody run up. Oh, but no, we, we don't have that, and that, that's to be figured out. And, uh, and you know what the he funny has to have thing? a shield with, B in it, with a massive B on it. Do, do you know what's funny is that the, the name Raoul Bedford was originally a joke because what it was is changed the name. And I when, when I was thinking about the name, I was actually in Miami at the time and uh, I was there aware of Beckham had created Into Miami. Mm -hmm. I was like, that's kind of cool. I, I, maybe we'll do Into Bedford. And I was just like, Into Bedford doesn't, doesn't ring right. No. I was like, well, let's just go with Raoul Bedford as a joke. It's a great name. I think it is. People hate it. Some people hate it. Only people with NSOH. No sense of humor. Yeah. And... Uh, it's really funny. Like the, one of the things with comedy is you put two things that aren't supposed to go together next to each other. And the, the you know, Real being sort of exotic in Spanish and Bedford being as sort of <laughs> know. You know, as ordinary as it comes. And you put the two together and you have comedy and, and it, has, it puts a smile on your face. You know what? Sometimes uh, with doing this podcast, people have said, oh, what's it like with it growing everything? And I always say, you can, you can never objectively see yourself. So you are just still you. From today to day, you're still you. Whereas other people may see and go, oh, you're interviewing a president or you're doing this, but you're still you. I can't objectively see Bedford. What, is, what do you think of Bedford? When you think of Bedford, what, is, what comes to mind? Well, there's something intrinsically comic in the sound of the word Bedford, you know, because it's for bed. It just sounds like it's, it's, it's just got a sort of duh sound to Shit it. Shit town. Yeah, but it, but the, and then I just associate it with Luton, um, Slough, all those kind of <laughs> satellite towns. Do you know what I mean? And, and yeah. I just do it from, you know, I just back in the day I used to do gigs when I was still on the circuit. And, you know, you'd come out on that high street, 11 o'clock, they used to have, pubs used to shut at 11 o'clock and they'd throw everyone out, 11, 11.30 on the high street. There'd just be a fight yeah. Every 10 metres, yeah. you know, just lads pissed, having fights over girls and girls screaming. And Where were you playing? The Corn Exchange? I did the Corn Exchange a few times and there was another club, I think it was called The Shed, but you'd come over a bridge and if you went straight on, you'd come into the town centre where the Corn Exchange is, but you'd turn right and you'd go up the road there for about a mile. And there was The a Shed, pub. that's off Castle Road. There's yeah. a pub next door to it. Well, no, it was, in the, it was in the back of the pub. Yeah, so that area... It's called Castle Quarters. That's like the nicest area of Bedford. It's okay. right by the river. It's beautiful. It's, it's it was a, a nice gig. Yeah, it's a nice area. Uh, but the Corn Exchange is right in the town centre. 
So you come out of that and take a left and there's a pub, famous pub at the end called The Rose. Okay. And, you know, anyone, I mean, I don't go there anymore because I'm too old, but you used to say Rose to close. You'll go there till it closes. My son's just started going there. <laughs> it's so funny. I will say just an interesting thing. When you go to most towns doing gigs, again, my days of doing this are in the past now. I don't drive and do that, the circuit, as much as I did. But most towns you'd go to, and you'd go to the audience, what's it like here? And they'd all go, it's a shithole. And they'd say that, Luton, Bedford, whatever, Watford, they'd all go, oh, it's a shithole. The one place where they would never say that, I'll see if you can guess what it is, and it's in your neck of the woods. Oh, one place. The one that were really precious about it and defended the town's reputation. Milton Keynes? Yes. Ah. Isn't that interesting? And I think it's because it's a new town and everyone says Milton Keynes is a shithole. And so the people are actually quite, no, it's good, it's really good. Well, I think the thing about Milton Keynes, it's essentially Sim City, because you, you, you've played Sim City, the game, right? No. Oh, Sim City is the game where you create a city, you put, you put in the roads, you put in the hospital, okay. you put in the schools, and then things go wrong and you have to fix it. And, and the natural thing to do is you build a grid. You've, you basically build New York because you think, well, mm -hmm. road, straight roads. Uh, and Milton Keynes is very much like that. It's a grid. And so it's easy to get lost. Yeah, but it's a new city and it seems new. But actually, when you live locally, Milton Keynes is great because of the facilities it has. There is a snow dome, so you can go snowboarding. There's a big shopping center. There's a massive lake if you want to go wakeboarding, go for a walk. There's Milton Keynes Village, which is beautiful. So there are a lot of shit parts of Milton Keynes, but facilities-wise, it's got everything you would want out of a new city. And now they, they have a football team. <laughs> I was going to say, the it shows, yeah, because I'm born out of Wimbledon. But yeah. the fact that... And controversial, I've got a lot of people who are founding shareholders in AFC Wimbledon uh, Good, yeah. born out of that. But, but the fact that MK Dons came into existence shows that that neck of the wood needs a big football team. Yeah, they just know. did it the wrong way there. Yeah. You know, because we know yeah, Wimbledon, the crazy gang. Was it in 89 they beat us in the cup mm -hmm. final? Beardsley yeah. Beardsley missed the penalty? Uh, yeah. Or was it Ray Houghton? I don't remember. I think it was Beardsley. It was a game remember. we should have won. Yeah, we lost one nil. Should have been a sending off as well. But you know, and I'm so, it, like at the time I was disappointed. I'm so glad they had that day now. Like, and what a team! Like yeah, Billy yeah. Joe's, Dennis Wise, like fashion brutal. Um, but what what was done to them was wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, franchising a club away, they should have found them a ground, and that was wrong. And some people have you know already criticised me and said, oh you're no different to what's happened at Wimbledon. You're taking over club, you're rebranding. I was like, well, hold on a second. No, it's very different. Well, the club I've bought has got really no fans, like a few handful, and they're usually the friends of the, the team. Um, they're like, well, you're changing the name. I was like, well, check the history. They've changed their name before. You, you weren't bothered before. Um, and actually, we, we're doing something good. Like, if I'd have bought Bedford Town, if I you know, had the chance, we would not have changed their name. They would have stayed as Bedford Town. And, you know, they would probably have stayed home. Real Bedford is a great name. <laughs> can you, can you imagine cut a cup draw where it comes out? Gary Lineker, Tottenham playing Real Bedford. Yeah, it's just funny. Yeah. It, it will make all the pundits laugh. It yeah. will make everyone smile. You know, Arsenal changed their name. You know, would Arsenal be where they would were if they were still in Woolwich? What were they called? Woolwich. They, Woolwich Ar well, they were called Woolwich Arsenal. That's where the actual yeah. Arsenal is in Woolwich. And then they moved from there up to uh, Highbury. You know, so... It, other clubs have done it. And people people are not going to forget the name. They're going to hear Rail Bedford. Yeah, they, dro they dropped Woolwich and kept the Arsenal. Rail Bridford is a great name. And if people don't like it, as I say, no sense of humour. Nobody likes it. It's us. their problem. Nobody, Nobody likes, likes us. us. We don't care. We don't that care. is poetry. Yeah. The best football chant the lot. Um, Millwall. Now, I think you said, you know, a lot of people complaining and don't like you. I think, like, if you, when you're on Bitcoin Twitter and you're arguing about, shit coins or whatever it is you know you get how aggressive bitcoin twitter is and i, I say to people if you think our arguments on social media over brexit was bad you wait till you see arguments between bitcoiners over you know bitcoin and ethereum whatever it is football i know is like 10 times even more vitriolic the only, the only thing that's worse than football i think is boxing but foot, but but they're both equally bad and you know you see, you hear all those former players complaining about you know racist tweets or whatever but it, it, it's not just races, it's like, it's just full on aggression. Do you know what? I think I and figured I think, out why. Okay, tell me why in a sec, but I, I, was, I was just going to say, you're going to get this now, this is going to be your life, and you, you, you know how to deal with it. Yeah. But the bigger Bedford get, like on one side you'll get 
the bigger your support will grow. But on the other side, the bigger the vitriol, the more vitriolic things will get too. Well, I, I mean, I'm no, um, I'm not, <laughs> it's not new to me again, trolled on Twitter and I've brought it on myself a number of times. And, you know, even recently where I was tweeting about <laughs> having COVID and uh, saying, I'm lucky I'm vaccinated, it would have been much worse. Like it wound some people up and I got a lot of shit and that's fair. But uh, it made but it was me, funny. It was funny, but it made me step back and realize it's like, uh, the best way is to ignore things and just have that thick skin. And sometimes I have it and sometimes I don't. And so when these football people are coming at me now, it's kind of like, I'm used to this and, and that's absolutely fine. And there there are criticisms, Dominic, there will be more criticisms and, and it will be a range of things. But the truth is that we know the model of football is broken. It is broken for all but maybe six, seven, eight mm -hmm. teams. And the reason it's broken is because of player wages and uh, and it will continue to be broken because of player wages all i'm do all i want to do is do but something player wages time. will blame they'll say well it's tv money and you know agents and yeah and it's just a weird model where they you know <laughs> free market people will hate this but football needs a salary cap to protect it from that because without Jimmy a, Hill will be turning in his grave. I know, but without I, I'm not saying you should, but like it, that's the, the only way to fix that as a salary cup. Otherwise, it's always going to be chairman going into their pocket trying to find money because he's going to get another you know in our division fifty quid there and the top division another fifty grand there. So I'm not saying this should be. I'm just saying that would that would change that part of the financing. But anyway, the point is non, non league football does struggle. Mm -hmm. everybody struggles and they always need a chair with a bit of money and I've come in and said okay I've just got a new model here and my model isn't based on the just the town it's based on an idea we can own Bitcoin and therefore the Bitcoiners can support us globally and they can help us like grow this club and and in the end if I get this right what does it mean outside of the fact that they forget into the you know hopefully into the football league I can deliver grassroots football to Bedford so I mean, already we are about to launch an academy, you know, an actual facility, so a bunch of kids can get uh, educated and train on football every day. Have you, we, have you had to buy a load of land? Have you got no, land? No, we've got, a, we've got land. We've got a, a lease from the council. Okay. But we, we will Do they like a, you, the council? We haven't had the meeting with them yet. Okay. If they dislike us, they are anti-Bedford because my, very, my message from them will be, this club had a £15,000 budget last year, I have already sold, I'm now up to £700,000 in sales of sponsorships. We haven't even got our merch listed. We That's a million dollars for our American <laughs> yeah. business. We haven't got our merch listed. We haven't done our street. Like, we're f weeks into this and we've already closed £700,000 in sponsorship. Our turnover for the year, I think, will be about £1.5 which is about the same as a League Two club. Okay? So what does that mean for Bedford? It means I can launch an academy, a set of youth teams, a woman's team i can launch uh i can build a 4g pitch which is desperately needed i can what's a 4g pitch the um kind of astro turfy but not like the luton astro yeah. turf pitch is the modern ones okay that's for training and stuff you can actually play on it as well up until uh i can't remember which i think it's a conference we'll have to check it might okay. even be league two playing 11 aside on astro turf yeah. so you can't slide tackle you can't slide tackle and you can't shoot it's shooting off that floor is really hard mm. but I don't want to play our home games on there. I, I, Do I've you got, play football at all? I used to. Oh, okay. shit. I've got one claim to fame with football. I've scored at St. James's Park. Oh. I played. A, I used to play Sunday League, and one of our players was a big Newcastle fan, and he found out um, off-season, they, they, for a month or two months, they allow people to pay to play on the pitch. You pay a £1,000, you play another team who pays a £1,000, and then what they do is they use that money to relay the pitch. Huh. So we, we, you, and you, it's an hour game. It's 30 minutes each way. I was on the bench... Uh, I came on, I don't know, 20 minutes in, we're one nil down. And this, I used to play up front, but big guy, I wasn't fast. And he came over my shoulder and I just wellied it, a 25 yard lob into the. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. And I also set up the, the, the winner. Um, but no, I was shit. <laughs> I was always too fat and slow. Uh, but anyway, so if I get this right, we get a women's team, we get a um, youth team, we get an academy, we get a 4G pitch, which the community can use, we can put money into grassroots football. And if we get in the league, there will be other teams and their fans coming into the town spending money, mm -hmm. creating jobs. I will always say, what is the downside to what I've done? Just tell me that. If you don't like what I've done, what's the downside? What's the net impact? You don't like the name. Okay, fine. You don't like the name. 
The name has lots of international supporters who are spending money, which is putting money in Bedford. Like, tell me the downside. And it won't be a downside. It will be just be like, oh, you've got no history. We don't understand football. Yeah, it will be all that stuff. But it's like, yeah, we're a company. Every football team is a company, whether you like it or not. And we're going to be a successful company. That That isn't a faceless corporate thing. No. It's just, it, it gives us that leverage to support local football in Bedford and, and like I say, just do something for my town. And I'd be very proud of that. I'm not ashamed of it. Will you televise the games or not televise, you know, put them on YouTube or whatever? Yeah, well, we, well not YouTube. So we're streaming a game this, um, this Saturday, the first time. Um, the, you have to geo-block at 3 p.m. because of the blackout. Do you know about that? Oh, right. Yeah. So people Explain don't know what, what that is. Yeah, so in the UK, <laughs> to protect long league football, low league football... Uh, Saturday afternoon, three o'clock, there's a blackout. I think it's from 2.45 or 2.15 to like 5.15. There's a blackout. Yeah. You can't show games because if you start showing Premier League games there, people won't go and watch their local team. It's a great idea. I love it. I love the blackout. Fully support that. And so we will be streaming. Our and your games game. will always be on a Saturday afternoon. Always on a Saturday. Well, no. So one of the things is, I mean, we can approach the league and say, can we play on a Friday evening? Okay. Or so we don't clash. Saturday lunch or whatever, yeah. Yeah, so we, so we can stream the games. Um, but yeah, so we're going to be streaming that for the first time this Saturday. Got a commentator coming down. So how will you stream it? Because you're playing at a different time. So we're playing at three o'clock. So oh, you'll stream it at yeah. five? No, no, no. We'll stream it at three, but we'll have a geo block so you can't watch in the UK. Uh, That's I why see. we can't do it via YouTube. I've got you, I've got it. And then anyone in the UK wants to watch it can watch it uh, at a later time. But yeah, we've got a company in coming to do that. Um, oh, so you hired a, a company, a professional broadcasting. Yeah. Okay. This Who's it, the commentator? Uh, it's just some local lad. So Tom, oh, okay. Tom found him, and uh, you know we listened to some of his stuff. He's quite interesting. He's, you know, let's give him a shot. You know, and, and we're paying him, and uh, yeah, so he's going to come. And what, how, what does he comment on local radio or something? Uh, I, no, he's done some local sports. Okay. He'd need someone. Someone like you next to him would be helpful. I'd, I'd be honoured and delighted. You free on Saturday? Uh, this coming Saturday, yeah. yes. Three o'clock? Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll sit next to him. I'll be the um, pundit. Yeah. Well, so we, we wanted to get a local like celeb, but we don't I won't really know any have... of the players. Well, we've done all the research. Again, Tom's brilliant. Tom's been on this. He's basically reached out to all the players, got all the information about them, their background, their best moments in football. So the commentator's got stuff so you can talk about the players. But but yeah, we've got, we've got a gantry being built. We've got two cameras. And we're filming and streaming that game on Saturday, and I'll go out to the. Um, I think it would I've be. I've done, you know, I've done. I in, back in the nineties, I used to work for Eurosport, and so I I've did done. Not know that. Yeah, I, I, well, I used to be the voice of all their promos. But they, what would happen is they'd be. It was it was always out in Paris, and you know people were flying in and out, and you'd always get some like a French bloke. You you get two hundred and fifty quid for to do a job to do the day's promos. But then there'd be a guy walking up and down and goes, right, the commentator for Strongest Man hasn't shown up. Can anyone commentate on Strongest Man? And, he, and you'd go, I'll do it, I'll do it, because you'd get an, another 175 quid. And so, you know, you, and you were out in Paris anyway. So I've commentated, you know, loads of sports I know absolutely nothing about. I and I used to do, like, Football Mundial, I used to be the, the voice for Football Mundial, if you ever watched that, and um, Euro goals and various things. But that tended to be scripted. But I'd be delighted. But uh, this guy... Like if he's a young guy and he's got ambitions as a sports commentator and he's done all his research, yep. he is the ideal person for it. Yeah, he does. And he, you know, he's, we've, we've listened to some of his stuff and he's, you know, he's young, he's interesting, enthusiastic, but he, you know, he, he, he is local, which is good. Which yeah, is yeah. Good for us. he wants but to be totally biased. I think having, having you next to him would be would good for him. But I think what, he's, what will be interesting is I still think some of the people, the international people, because I'm building up this community of mm -hmm. international people. I've had, I've registered 65 international supporters clubs, Bitcoiners. Right, what Cambodia, three in Australia, twenty in the US, in Chile, and all around the world, right? Who they're Bitcoiners who want to support this team. They are this is my club now. I support them. I think there's a handful who still don't understand what this team is, who think I've bought maybe a Premier League team. <laughs> Despite the fact we say, listen, this is tenth tier because the problem with the, the you know Americans is their sport is a le one level and their divisions are flat. And then you play off, right? Whereas we have a hierarchy. Yeah, yeah. So they don't have this idea of non-league and FA Cups. and They'll be of... charmed by it. Well, that's what I think. As you I do post-match interviews and all that. Another quite good thing is um, to engage the local <clears throat> schools and so on is have the kids on to do a uh, penalty shootout at yep. half-time and all that. 
you know. Yeah, I mean, local community engagement is super important. We're going to be running a fans forum, uh, hopefully in February, where I'm going to present the vision of the club and what I want to do for the town, and people can come down and criticise, ask questions, and, you know, the goal oh, is to so get, good, Peter. It's get just, people along. I just know, well, as soon as I read your thread, I just thought this is absolutely glorious there's just so many it's a real kind of convergence of things going on and it's just it's fantastic calvin air sort of done i know I, the uh, but you know he's sponsors air united i do know that. and i think they do they have bitcoin sv on their they do shirts so i think he must have given them some money but it's not i think that's more of a vanity thing for him because it's air and air this isn't a sort of you know he's not from air you know. do, you, do, you want to, do you want to hear something funny? I haven't actually told this publicly yet, but... Uh, oh, I forgot because of all the Craig Wright. I forgot all no, that. No, I said something. Do you remember, um, you know Richard Hart, the yeah. hex guy? Motherfucker, fair play to him. It was quite funny. I met him the other day, actually. Did I've, you? I've never... He was an extra... I had dinner with him and I've, I'll never forget it. <laughs> but you can tell me about that later. I mean, I'm not a fan of hex and I'm not a fan of his techniques. Uh, and I've told him that quite publicly. But fair play to him, he tried to troll me and nearly got away with it in the most brilliant way. He tried to sponsor, get that by the naming rights for Bedford Town at the time where I was trying to get them. And he tried to do that and he offered them 40 grand, which is something you should definitely take if you're Bedford Town and you don't understand Bitcoin and Hex. And if he'd have done that, that would have really put me in a fucking tricky position. So uh, they turned me down. They asked me about him. I was like, do not take this money. And don't not take it because it's me. Don't take it because you don't want this shit associated with your stadium. But if Richard Hart had pulled that off, I would have been like, hmm, fair play, that's funny. Okay. You dickhead. <laughs> but we should talk about the Bitcoin stuff. Yeah, I'm interested in the model, the business yeah. model. So really, um, I'm leveraging Bitcoin and I'm leveraging my community to try and make this work. And I'm leveraging my contacts to try and make this work. Uh, I've sold um, a lot of sponsorships so far, and I've sold shirt sponsorships for similar prices you would pay for a team in the championship. And I've sat down. Who sponsor you? Who sponsor the shirt? Uh, I haven't announced the front okay. of shirt yet, uh, but I have. Oh, you've got one sponsor for the back and one for the front. And I've got fr- I've got front of shirt, and then I've got shoulder home and shoulder away. Ah. Oh. Um, and so shoulder home is Compass Mining. Okay. And shoulder away is Casa. And so my model is we're a Bitcoin standard. The companies that sponsor us will be companies we use. So, yeah, I mean, we're not mining as a as a club, but Casa are going to secure our Bitcoin treasury. Mm-hmm. And, I've uh, got a Casa wallet. There you go. There you go. Um, and uh, there's a couple of others I, I just can't announce just yet, but they, we're going to use their services. And it's very much that we're on a Bitcoin standard. We're not forcing Bitcoin down to people's throat because people are like, oh, you're going to pay the players. I mean, look, if a player comes to me and says, Pete, can you pay me in Bitcoin? Yes, we will pay you in Bitcoin. But I'm not going to mandate it because that's fucking annoying. Like These guys might be on 50, 100 quid a week. They're like, I don't want this fucking Bitcoin shit. I've got to buy some beer. Just give me, yeah. give, me, give me some pounds. Likewise, at the club, it's not going to be like force people to pay in Bitcoin. But we will have the ability to buy your burger in Bitcoin if you want it. Uh, what oh, I will, at the ground, you'll, the, all, the, all the facilities at the ground will take Lightning Wallet and all yeah, that. Yeah, eventually we'll get to there. What we will do, what I want to do is on match days... You know, a certain time before the game, I want to run run a Bitcoin meetup. If you want to come down a couple of hours early, we're going to have a Bitcoin meetup, introduction to Bitcoin, what's been going on. Not forcing it down people's throat, just mm-hmm. helping them understand and learn it. But like most football clubs stand for one thing, which is winning and excellence. And we stand for a little bit more. We stand for financial literacy, which I think is super important mm. in the world of football because most clubs operate like they haven't got any fucking idea about financial literacy. And, uh, you know, that's what we I stand for. I want football chance where fiat money is in the football chart. <laughs> you know, that, that, I'm, I'm conscious of not doing too much of that. Like, we're the Bitcoin club, but I don't want to be the forced Bitcoin down your throat club, like, no. to the point of being fucking annoying. But football is broken because of the finance. This you can is refer to other clubs as fiat teams. Fiat teams, You know, yeah. our safe team calls it fiat food and fiat, fiat music and all that, fiat teams. <laughs> <laughs> but we we are... Oil-backed teams. If, if the Bitcoin standard is right, then it should work for this club. And our time horizon... Is, like, this is another thing, Dominic. So you, you'll, 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 you'll keep your main treasury, your cash holdings in Bitcoin? We'll keep a certain amount in okay. it. Not all of it, because we, we don't know what will happen to the price. We, don't want the, we wouldn't want the price of Bitcoin to crash and it ruin the... Yeah, future of the club, but we will put some of it in there. 
because we believe in Bitcoin long term. And presumably not. your sponsors will pay, pay you and sponsor you in Bitcoin. Or... Again, they don't have to. Okay. I mean, one has. We announced Luxor, the mining pool, and they paid us in Bitcoin and we just put that straight in our treasury. And we, another thing we're doing, I've put a donation thing up on the website. You can donate Bitcoin or Lightning. And at the end of the season, we're just going to collect that up and donate that to local uh, grassroots football. Okay, and that's, very nice. And everything's audited. I mean, I've just done my first transparency report up on the website. You can go on, you can click December, you can see our accounts, you know, what we spent money on, what's coming in, what we've got in Bitcoin. I've even got the um, the address of the Bitcoin wallet so you can, you know, it's mm. fully transparent. I mean, no other football club was going to do anything like this. And, no. And we open and if ourselves you get, up. Um, if Bitcoin goes on one of its bull runs again and goes to 100 grand or something, the, the finances will be looking very good. Well, that's another interesting. I, I, I'll come, well, I'll tell you that now. So, one of the things I've been considering is raising money. Mm -hmm. Like, do we raise, like, I can run this club. I could run this as cash cow. I mean, if we do 1.5 million turnover and it costs us 250 grand to run it, there's 1.2 million profit. Mm -hmm. 1.25 million profit. I can pay myself a lovely dividend, but I'm not going to do that because I want the money to go into the club mm -hmm. and, you know, bank it. But I do like the idea of, uh, opening up the equity to fans to own some. Yeah. And I'm going to do a consultation with Bitcoiners on the idea of a security token. So bear with me. Mm. Tokens, historically, as Bitcoiners have a very bad reputation. Yeah. And I think it's because shitcoins, you don't tend to have claim to anything. But if you have a security token, you essentially buy an equity. Your token is a representation mm -hmm. of equity in the club. And I like the idea of going out and saying, okay, I'm going to put 30% up available for Bitcoiners to buy. And that's, that does a few things. That gives them some... And would it, be, would it be auction or would you have put a valuation on it? I don't know yet. There's a lot to think about with that. Mm. I mean, that's why I want to... I don't really want to do it to the end of the season because I want to, at the end of the season go, look... Yeah, if they're exchangeable tokens, then it's beautiful. Then people can trade the shares. Yeah. So and that would be nice because that gives them some kind You've of You've got to claim. keep 51%. I'm going to keep more than 51%. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, but yeah, to give people that option because that gives them... Um, yeah, skin in give, the game I think so and also give um, players the option to take a share yeah yeah. you know I mean then, it, then it'll go back to like the old cooperative societies where all the locals had a share and you know it's a bit like playing your employees in, in, in options and shares in the company it often inspires greater loyalty and greater deeds from them but think about it like this I have the ultimate goal of bringing Premier League football to Bedford which is the most ridiculous concept ever. How can you take a club like Bedford into the Premier League? It's nigh on impossible, right? If, if, if everything went your way, it would take 10 years? If everything went your way, it would be nine years, nine promotions. Now that's unrealistic because Man City can sign all the best players in the world and still not win the Champions League. So we yeah. know that in football. But Salford proved you can take a team non-league team, up the divisions into the league. Have Salford gone tits up? What's happened to no, them? No, no. Oh, they're still I mean, to... yeah, they're losing money. I think they lost a couple of million quid, I think. But I they're backed by Skulls, aren't they? Well, Skulls yeah, Neville. Skulls, Neville, Beckham, Nicky Butt and Giggs. Um, but I think they've stopped putting money in and I think it's this, uh, what's his name, Lim, the, 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 the billionaire guy's putting money in. But they, I think they lost two million in there last year because... And what division are they in? They are in League Two now. So they got up into the Football League, but... So they're not doing that well. Well, I mean, they got into League well, Two. For, no, that, okay, so from nowhere. But Yeah, from nowhere. But they're lo losing a lot of money. Because, two millions a lot for yeah. League Two side to lose. They're losing a lot of money because they have that same problem is that their revenue model is a catchment area of Salford and mm -hmm. maybe some people who like their players. We have this unique thing. There's 150 million people mm. around Bitcoin around the world. How many of those can we get into this and buy a shirt? And Will, will Bedford become a pilgrimage like El Salvador has? I need to get to Bedford and go and watch them play. Yeah. So we've got we've got a unique thing. We've got something which only the top Premier League clubs have is we have direct access to an international audience. Mm. But sorry, the thing I was going to say is that uh, Salford went from non-league to the Football League, and Brentford went from League Two to the Premier League. Yeah. How do you how do you do both? Let's let's not put a time scale. Just how do you do both? It's always going to come down to money being a major part of this. Hmm. But even with the best money, you still need excellence around everything else. But Brentford did the, the whole money, what's that, to, uh, the way they money measure? Ball. Yeah, they did the money, yeah. money ball thing, didn't Very they? Very smart guy runs those, the chairman. So my current plan is, can I get us in the Football League? Well, my commercial model is based on local and international audience, merchandise sponsorships, 
and uh, trying to direct sponsorships to Bitcoin people who might want their products and introducing new people to Bitcoin. Cool. That works. So let's get in the football league. My big idea is, what if I raised £50 million? Okay, bear with me. Firstly, it'd be completely unheard of because people are like, what do you mean you've invested £50 million into a 10th tier football team? Bitcoiners won't understand it. Mm -hmm. Nobody else will. But then a Bitcoin treasury. Hold it there for eight years whilst we try and get into the football league. What could that be? What could the value of that treasury be in eight years? Mm -hmm. you know, give me your low and high ball. You know, if you buy Michael Saylor's argument, you know, and, and, and it's the dominant monetary network and it becomes the default international currency. And we saw just this week, Iran is now taking Bitcoin yep. for its petrol, for its oil. Um, you know, half a million dollars a coin or something, I suppose, is possible. In, a, in eight years, probably a million dollars a coin is possible. It depends how much they debase money. And then in the opposite scenario, we, we head in, you know, they put up rates and all risk goes off and we head into a deflationary depression, which I, I just think that's so unlikely because, you know, of the inflate or deny, die scenario. But, you know, a full-on Great Depression-style depression, Bitcoin could go into the single thousands, I suppose. But I, I find that extremely unlikely because, you know, cash holds its value in a deflationary depression. And, I mean, Bitcoin at $50,000 it, it is expensive, but it felt expensive when it was a thousand dollars. Bitcoin always feels expensive. Yeah, there's never a time I've looked at Bitcoin and thought, "Oh, this is cheap today," even when it drops, because you know it still doesn't feel cheap because you don't immediately always go out and buy a load more. But there is a range. I, I mean, I don't see a scenario where in eight to ten years Bitcoin is worth less than it is now. I, it's got to be. It's got to be six yeah. digits at least, hasn't it? You know, so you raise a fifty million. Treasury, you, what you're giving yourself is a chance. Even if it just goes up at 10% a year. Yeah. But if it does that million dollars, which a lot of people think it will be, that's a 20x. Our treasury is suddenly a billion dollars. A billion pounds, sorry. We raise 50 million, 20x a billion pound. We are the most well-capitalized club in the world. Mm. We have no debt. We have a secure model. You know, we have and what happens if you do the sailor model and you take out debt against your Bitcoin? That's a potential as well. What, what I'm saying is like, Nobody will understand what we're doing, but when it works, they're going to be like, huh, what's going on here? That guy we laughed at, that guy from Bedford, he said he's going to get them in the Premier League. He said he's doing it on Bitcoin. We laughed at him. We said he's an idiot, said he doesn't understand football. What's he done? He's now got a team in the Football League. They've got a treasury which is worth tens of millions. We're all in fucking debt. He's created football opportunity in this town. Like, he is delivered. Maybe we should look at this Bitcoin. It's a bit like... If El Salvador's right in five years' time, because it will take years for them to prove it, every other country is going to go, why didn't we do that? Crypto.com sponsors quite a lot of American sport, yeah. North American sport, but th that's different when it's sponsorship. This is the core of the club. It's the core of the club. It's Bitcoin standard. If we're right about Bitcoin, then, then I will be right about Bedford. And we will deliver league football. And, but I, and, I, and I fundamentally believe this, Dominic. I... I I'm so certain that I can do this. Like, all I'm doing is working on this right now. I get up at six in the morning and I, I was awake. He's like, great, what can I do? Yeah, yeah. You know, and I'm... You got, you know, you, we all have our things we want to do and you have a clarity. When I say you, I don't mean you personally. One has a clarity, a vision, and you go, this is where the world's going. This is where I'm going. And, you know, I'm not running... I can see your vision and I can see it and I can see how it's you and I can see the clarity that you're seeing it with. And it just, you know, if you're looking for investors, I'm one of them. A lot of people want to do Yeah, it. I'll say. I mean, I put it, there's a little form on the website. If you're interested in investing, you know, fill in this form. 270 applications. I've already had one fund offered to cut me a check for a million pound right now. I said, right, when can we give you money? But I've just got to try and find the right way of doing it because... Yeah. You know, some <laughs> you don't want to give too much equity away too quickly, but at the same time, you the, the investors become your cheerleaders. Yeah, and, and and I will face a dilemma one day. It's like you know, if this is successful, well, will I want to sell it and I could become super rich? But wouldn't it be nice if the town owned this mm -hmm. club somehow and they town benefited from it? And you know, yeah, you could give a share to the town, not to the council, and not to Dave. <laughs> definitely not Dave the mayor. Um, you don't like Dave the mayor? Yeah, I think he created too many white elephants in Bedford. Meaning, 
I mean, he, you know, they built this cinema complex and restaurants and they put it in a weird location and they just made it difficult for businesses. All the businesses in it aren't, you know, there was a really good bar there that's closed down. He's just done a big project. The high street used to be two lanes. He's put it down to a single lane now and bigger kind of like sidewalks to try and encourage uh, people to go into the town and to use the... It's so like there's a ta- permanent traffic jam now, is there? Well, no, it's not the permanent. It's just like, how much fucking money have you spent on this? And when are you going to recognize, like, high streets are dying because of the internet? Like, yeah. stop trying to... He's trying He's trying to uh, hold up the melting ice cube. Yeah. I think the difference is when he's spending other people's money, whereas yours is slightly different because... I mean, I know it's other people's money because people are investing in it, but it's still your money because you own the club and, you know, it's, it's a, there's a different dynamic. Yeah, but you know what? I, I, I believe in this so much and, and I, I absolutely fundamentally think that I can do this and I think supported by the Bitcoiners, I can do it. What I hope is by doing this, other people look at this and go, like somebody else said to me, well, what happens if... Man, you turns around and they go, "Wow, this is amazing. Maybe we should buy a Bitcoin. Like, maybe that's going to somebody else doing it, and that means you'll never catch them." I was like, "Great, that's brilliant. Yeah, that's success. That's success because if other clubs start being more financially responsible and thinking about their treasury and promoting Bitcoin, then that's that's a good. It's thing. good for Bitcoin, and you you they'll all be you know. It's, there's nothing wrong with being the trendsetter. <laughs> yeah. um, can I just offer you another? We we'll come back to the subject of players' wages. Yes, I've just got a thought on this and. Again, this is me thinking as a comedian, not as a football player. But there's so many um, parallels between the two. Um, A lot of football players have got this reputation for being totally mercenary. And they'll go wherever the biggest paycheck is. And that's a threat for us. It is a threat for you. And there's a certain amount of truth to it. Mm -hmm. And especially when the football player is advised by an agent and the agent's responsibility is to get his client the biggest possible paycheck. So, you know, there, there is that dynamic. But what you notice with comedy, and I bet this applies to football as well, is a lot of comedians, you know, comedians are famously mercenary. There's an expression, comedians are laughing all the way to the bank and, you know, they, they will go wherever the biggest paycheck is. But they will also go to where the best platform is, which isn't always the best paycheck. So, for example, in the 70s, ITV paid more than BBC, but everyone would be on BBC because BBC repeated the shows and you know, uh, BBC comedy was just the place to be in the 70s and 80s. It isn't anymore. Um, A lot of comedians will, given the choice between, you know, a five grand corporate gig or just a 200 quid gig at some nice club up the road, they'll go and do the cheaper gig because it's a nice gig. They can do their material. They they can make their statement. Do you know what I mean? So a lot of players will not necessarily go to the best playing club. They'll want to pay play, you know, where they can play in the position they want to play, when the game suits them, when there's a really good camaraderie, there's a really good atmosphere, they feel a loyalty to that club, to that area, whatever. So so I think even if you do cap salaries, if you get have a well-run club that people want to play for, which is a fantastic platform, you know, let's say I'm, I'm your centre forward and um, I, I'm only being paid 50 quid a week to play for you, but I've got some guy, you know, Bitcoin miner in Kazakhstan who becomes my biggest fan and he keeps giving me Bitcoins. I'm like, fine, I'll play for you because I might not be getting, you know, the same wages I'd be getting if I'm playing for Man United, but I'm getting all these donations from Bitcoin miners in Kazakhstan. Yeah, I, Do you know what I mean? There's all these things Well, we play, can give so. each, I mean, a few people have got in touch saying, can you give us the player profiles and give each one a QR code? Yeah. Yeah. Or, you know, maybe you want to sponsor a particular player if, you, you know, if that player does something that symbolizes what your business do, does or... Yeah, you know. I'm, I'm really conscious of it. I mean, yeah, football is full of mercenaries. Absolutely, it is. And, uh, it's but it's not also an art. It is. And, and Look, when somebody said, oh, these overpaid players, there's no players overpaid. The market has dictated their uh-huh. wages. And if you don't like it, so be it. But what about your job? If somebody came to you and said, oh, you come and work for the rival, I'm going to pay you double. Are you telling me you wouldn't go? If you're on 50 grand a year, you've got over 100 grand. Most people would. That's how the free market works. Yeah. The market works out to, to reward the best people for the best job. The best actors get paid the best, okay? Mm-hmm. You, well, generally speaking, generally speaking, the most marketable best actors, yeah, okay, kind of, if you know what I mean. Like I the, the Rock. I mean, you know. Um, and, and footballers, the best usually get paid. Right? Yada, yada. And not, not always, but generally it's speaking. It's surprising how many 
like weird uncontrollables are at play in sport. Yeah. You know, for example, the one that I always use, everyone says Gary Neville was the best England right back. Well, you know, of his time. Mm -hmm. But I would argue that Phil was a better player than Gary. But because Gary was only able to play at right back, whereas Phil was good enough to play at left back or centre midfield, if Phil had just gone, he was a victim of his own versatility. If he said, no, I'm playing right back, you know, he would have been, that would have been his position. Yeah. Did you see what I mean? So Kind of, yeah, yeah. That's, I don't know, I've, I've never really, I think... I, Gary never used to say, I'm not even the best right back in my house. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyway, just back to the motoring. So that, yeah. that is going to happen. And I am thinking about that a lot. And again, me and Tom talked about this. We are going to have a very strict budget and transfer policy because we know people are going to go, what, Bedford? The guys who've got 1.5 million? Yeah, because we're going to be a victim of our own transparency. Yeah, when, Bill, when Bitcoin goes on one of its bull runs. Yeah, so but it's, we, we're going to say, look, if you want to come, this is our policy. You're on 150 quid a week there. You can't come and ask us for 300. It's 150 quid a week. But what I will put in place is I'm going to put in very good bonuses. That this is our bonus structure. So if you deliver, the team delivers, you get promoted, there's your bonus. Come and earn it. But no, you, you're not going to double your wages under us. Uh, but you will come and get, come to a high-profile club, you know, and other opportunities come with that. The other risk we've got is everyone's going to want to fucking beat us. Yeah. Every game's going to be a cup final. Salford had that. Okay. Yeah, you're, every game's a cup final. But so be it. We, you know, we, we just have to put up with that. I think you'll find there's, there's a load of players out there in their 30s who haven't got gigs who will come and play for you for a nice, you know, give them whatever you pay them at the end of the game. And uh, you might find there's a big well of, of talent there. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, you, I think you're certainly right. But like, I've got, I mean, I'm a few weeks into this, Dominic. I've got yeah, a lot yeah, to yeah, figure yeah, out. Yeah, but I mean, I think it's. I and think it's it is probably exciting. your talent scout or your manager's job to find those guys anyway. Well, I need to find a scout. Okay. There's, a lot, there's so many roles to fill. Honestly, it's incredible the amount of stuff that goes into. Are you getting people club. writing to you off asking for jobs? All kinds. So we've I've already built up an exec team where I've been basically. The rules are nobody gets paid apart from the manager, the players. And the support staff, like Big John, who works behind the bar, has never been paid. He's now being paid. But nobody on... I want to bring in a team of professionals to run it in a very professional way. And it's, right now it's all volunteers. But you know, when we're, we're divvying it up. Somebody's going to run merch. Someone's going to run memberships. Somebody's going to run supporters club. Somebody's going to run CRM. And it's like, it's a few hours work a week. You come to your exec team meeting. You tell us what you've done and what you're doing. And everything's measurable. You know, and everything is about driving the success of this club forward commercially and then creating this kind of like environment of excellence. You know, what can we do to create an environment of excellence? Um, but yeah, I mean, I've had thousands of emails already and I was filtering them has been so difficult, but it's, can I try out for the club? Can I be your manager? Can I run your merch? Can I, <laughs> you know the funny Any one names? Is, what, known names? Yeah. Uh, no, no, no known names, but, I mean, decent, like, known within the game. No, no journeyman. No, no journeyman yet. And I think we're a bit early for that. Um, what I have had a huge amount of is, hey, I'm so-and-so, I'm a scout in Argentina and I've got players. <laughs> I'm so-and-so, I'm a scout in Brazil, I've got players. Hey, I'm scouting across in the south of France, I've got players. I can't believe how many of those I've had. Amazing. Yeah, the, that, that really surprised me. They're like, that they think a 10th tier team wants these players and... Yeah, that's. Uh, but I've got. I have. I've got some. You know. Uh, I once wrote to, uh, when I was in the nineties. I wrote a play for Radio Four. Never got commissioned in the end. But it was about a bloke who won the lottery and bought Letitia for his park team. Oh fuck, man! You ever go? It's on, a bit like this. Similar story, isn't it? I tell you, anyone listening, go on YouTube and search for Letitia's greatest goals. Yeah. This is the football player with the best collection of greatest goals ever for Southampton. Oh yeah. He's the best player. Uh, he's a proper contrarian and he's, he's yeah. quite um, accessible. I interviewed him. We, we did this thing called Unlocked a, about a year ago and I interviewed him on that. He was, he's quite reachable. Maybe he'd come and do something for you. I'd like you. to talk to him. I'm trying to get, uh, I want to see Gary. He's very active on Twitter. Yeah, yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, I'm, I want to go and see Gary Neville. I'm trying to get that because I just want to go and say, look, what did you do at um, Solver? What did you learn? What are the, you know, what are the mistakes I'm going to make? You, you know? I imagine he's harder to get hold of. I think I've got it. Okay. Yeah, somebody else who knows him is going to well, it's going to be asking him tomorrow night for us actually. Uh, so hopefully that will happen. Fingers crossed. Uh, but I'd like to talk to him about that. But I, I would, I'm willing to talk to like anyone who can help make this, you know, push this forward and help us with this because 
it, it is such an important project for m- me and my town, but I also think such an important project for Bitcoin. Like I feel, <laughs> if you can make the videos, like the, the footage, really entertaining. Yeah. And in fact, you know, after a game, put together a highlights package of the game and make it funny. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Well, I need I, you for that. I, I'd, be, I'd be honoured and delighted. I'll show you some of the old football videos I made when we, of the Comedians football game. Yeah. I, took, I had to take them off YouTube because whatever. But I'll show you them. They're really funny. But if you can make it funny and then have little viral videos on, on YouTube with funny football clips, it, it'll be huge. Do you know what I've also got tomorrow? So the guy I made the film, in, which is imminent coming out in, uh, in El Salvador, the director I work with, Neil Berkeley, he's flying in tomorrow. Because what we decided is that we should be documenting this. I'll say. That's the amount of shit I've missed. Like, it's Make unbelievable. It, yeah, you've got to just got to start yeah. and do the Netflix thing, you know. Well, Ryan Reynolds is doing his thing with Wrexham, but when he's bored of Wrexham, I'm going to still be in bed for doing this. And uh, What is that? What's he doing in Wrexham? He, they invested two million into Wrexham. Ryan, Ryan Reynolds. Reynolds, the, the famous yeah. actor. And another is one, Is he yeah. from Wales or something? No. So... It came out about a year and a half, a year ago, a year and a half ago, and it's like Ryan Reynolds is buying Rex and investing in Rex and whatever, and it's like, oh, that's weird and interesting. Now they're about to make the documentary about it. But, but look, great for them, great for Rex in that they've got some great sponsors now. I think they've got TikTok as a sponsor and Disney as a sponsor. Oh, my God. So that is great for Rexham. That team has got money and that team can be profitable and that can not pay. Hasn't got Bitcoin. Hasn't got Bitcoin. But the problem, their problem, the Ryan Reynolds problem is like, when does he get bored? Yeah. Like, I don't get bored of Bedford because no. I'm, I'm going to live there my whole life. When does he get bored? And and it's a little bit contrived in mm. that it's, all right, you put the money in because you wanted to make a TV series. I get it. Great. <laughs> Whereas mine's yeah, the other he's way around. Gone. When that TV series is over, he's gone, isn't Yeah, it? so this is the other way around. It's like, I want to buy Bedford. Oh, shit, we should make a TV series about this. Mm. And, and, and I I think it'd be good. I, I Yes, you could go to Netflix. I, I wish that. It feels like a BBC no, thing. I mean, I'm talking eventually. Yeah, not, it's too early. I'd love to get on the. I'd love to get the BBC to care enough to to make a documentary about this because I think it will be fascinating. Oh, brilliant! I can get up to do it though. You got any friends though? I do, and I'm always trying to shill my own stuff, <laughs> and uh, it's it's not easy. The problem with the BBC, you can is, narrate this. I'd be delighted, but the the problem with the BBC is a lot of the time it's decision by committee, and you think it's made up of leaders, but actually there's just a lot of followers there and they, they follow the crowd. And right, okay. It's, it just takes so long to get a decision. Even a negative one just takes forever. What about Channel 4 then? They're quicker. But I, I agree, this would be fantastic on them. And it's such a grassroots story. So Even good. just get some coverage on Football Focus. Yeah. Well, so the cameras start rolling tomorrow. Yeah, he's in. We're, he, you know, cameras start rolling tomorrow. We're going to create a sizzle, try and get someone to buy it. But even if they don't, we're just going to keep recording, keep recording. Yeah, we'll build up it. just, yeah. yeah. You build up the archive of yeah. material and keep doing, even if it's just videos on your camera, little v- vlogettes, even if you just, they're just for yourself. You know, end of the day, you've had a really bad day because so and so's blown you out and whatever. You know, you do your depressed one. And then when you're really happy because so and so signed, just, do you know what I mean? Just do your little vlogs and just stick them on a hard drive somewhere and they'll come in use for at some point, 100%. It's like, what do they say? Keep a diary. If you, if, keep a diary when you're young and the diary will look after you when you're old. Huh. And that's in, in the pre-vlog days, you know. Reminds me of something, I think my dad told me about car. Look after your car and your car will look after you. <laughs> <laughs> let, let me tell you one more thing, just because sure. um, uh, the, the, the most interesting thing that's come out of this for me, it's, and it's two parts, uh, Dominic, I, I was telling somebody about this the other day, but... Uh, the gap between games is like waiting for Christmas as a kid. You know, like when you That week, just those six days, seven days. It goes so slowly because all you want is that next game. And once it's done, it's like, what can we put in place to improve in the next game? That just blown my mind. I'm like, fuck, it's only Thursday. It must be so exciting. It is, but it's like, it eats away at me because I'm like, I'm kind of wishing my life away. I want the next game. But even more so interesting... So if you're going round... Okay, finish on that. Well, so, and then even more interesting is, uh, uh, as a Liverpool fan, you know, we've, had some, massive, we've had some massive games. Uh, I think of two Champions League finals that were huge. Uh, but when I was at the last game at Amptill, I was gripped like this, just watching it. It became... It wasn't just watching Bedford it was watching something that might change my town where I'm from 
and how important it became. And it became more important than any Liverpool game I've ever watched. That moment, that away game at Amptool Town <laughs> became more important than any Liverpool game I've ever watched. And and every Bedford game now will always be more important than any Liverpool game I've watched because it means so much to like me and what what I want to do for Bedford. So. Yeah, when they do those close-ups of the managers and the chairman and they look icy cool, you realise how cool those guys really are given the torrent of emotions they must be feeling. Yeah, I, I, um, I know Steve Parrish, the Palace chairman. Oh, yeah. Uh, used to be a, uh, he used to be one of my, when I had my digital agency, we did Palace's website work and email work and... Uh, I've asked to go and see him just to pick his brain. I texted him the other day about, about He it. seems quite amenable. He's great. You know what? Can I tell you something about that guy? Uh, when I... He saw me the day when I found out I was separating from my wife. And he said to me, he said, are you all right? And I was like, no, I'm separating from my wife. He's like, you've just got married. I was like, yeah, it's horrible. But bear in mind, he was just a client. And uh, he texted me later on that day. And it was the same day England played in Germany, a friendly at Wembley. And he said, oh... Are you busy tonight? I said, no. He said, right, I am left you my debenture. You've got two seats to England, Germany tonight. You and your son can go and you've got a meal in the thing. You know, I mean, he doesn't, I was just a supplier. Yeah, that's really nice. And he's a busy guy. And every single, I don't abuse the relationship, but every time I've reached out and said, look, I need something, he's always got back to me in 24 hours and he's always made it happen. He is a good fucking guy. Yeah. But I said to him about this thing, I said, Steve, I cannot, wait for each game i'm like struggling between them he said he said wait till you're on a bad run you won't want the next one to come <laughs> <laughs> he's done an amazing job yeah. turning palace around palace is a, have you been to games at palace yeah it's a fantastic round they fly the eagle up and down the uh the pitch, pitch at the yeah. of the game. it's great they've got great fans yeah the atmosphere there's incredible i watched on saturday i went millwall i went to the den and i watched millwall palace and yeah. i mean the millwall fans were great but so were the palace fans it was I, such a good atmosphere do you remember the, uh when brendan rogers was uh, managing liverpool and they nearly won the league mm. last game oh, no second same. was it second last game the yeah, palace yeah. game they were three nil up yeah yeah Drew through, I, was and they blew that, it. I was at that game we'd already blown it in the chelsea game yeah 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 but that you knew we'd really yeah. blown it then we'd yeah. lost our heads so i was at that game and i that was a good crowd i like i like palace i like the fans it's a lovely ground yeah i like what he's done i mean if and it feels like it's maintained its relationship with the with the area and it feels yeah you know it feels part of the area it's well, it's, it's, it's it's only about a mile from where i live i mean simon jordan kind of it kind of fucked around with that club. He, he ran it like his own little kind of like empire and his own like it was extension of his ego whereas what steve's done he's delivered something as a businessman for the fans you know for for the community and you go in if you went in there before when he bought it and you go in there now all the bars and the facilities he's put in there, it's incredible he's yeah. he's, he's crushed it. i must say when hodgson i thought hodgson was a great signing for them yeah and because you thought sort of wasn't for us him, no it's <laughs> terrible i think he could have been given time i think i think he he came into a ship that was players love over. him yeah. So Andy Johnson. I met him. He, 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 we met him. It was my dad's birthday and we went to the golf club to have um, lunch, you know, all family. There was about 10 of us around the table and Roy Hodgson was on the next table. Yeah. And so my two sons went up to him and said, can we have your photograph? And he was, you know, he was, he, was, he was having lunch with his wife on a Sunday and he was absolutely fine. He stood up and he was a nice man. Well, Andy Johnson is our best footballing export from Bedford. Uh, he, Andy Johnson, who used to play centre forward. Yeah, for Everton Palace, and, and, Palace and Everton. Yeah. Yeah. So he's from Bedford. My, oh, my, my son went to school with his son. His son's now at Stevenage, doing very well. Uh, he's a good player. But uh, I'm sure it was him I talked to and he said, uh, Roy Hodgson is one of his favourite managers he's ever played for. Like really understood and looked after his he, players. They hated him at England. Well, maybe it was Lineker and all that. They really got, I mean, it, it, he made some bad decisions, I think, for England. Yeah. I mean, you know, Kane taking the corners and stuff like that. It was... Yeah. He's liked by the players though. Yeah. The players really like him. But anyway, he did great. You thought you saw, you thought he was finished and he came to Palace and he did a great job for Palace. And then this season, you know, he stood down mm -hmm. and all the players were old. And you thought, I thought Palace were going to go down this season. I thought Vieira's coming in. It's too many old players. They've been great. Yeah. What are well, they, 10th, 12th, something like that? Yeah, well, when Vieira came in, it's one of those ones. It's like, oh, you're just being a manager because you were a successful player. Let's see how you do. I think he's going to be a great manager. Yeah. I think he's going to be one of the better ones. Absolutely. And they went 1-0 down against Millwall on Saturday and you thought, I thought Millwall are going to win this. And, and they oh. came, half-time talk, bollocking at half-time, they came straight back on and within five minutes, within who's, a who's minute. Who's that blonde lad in the midfield? Um, Gal uh, Connor, Connor Gallagher? Uh, yeah, I think he's great. He's terrific. Yeah. Is he gay? 
No, I don't think so. I think that's just Millwall fans being dicks. Okay, because there's been an inquiry at Millwall about the homophobic abuse thrown yeah. at Conor Gallagher. No, I just it's think... It's just because he's a pretty boy, is it? I think so. I'm okay. Millwall fans just being dicks. Okay. <laughs> I won't hear that. Um, they, they, uh, he's a terrific player. Yeah, great I play. think Chelsea, I think Chelsea are trying to buy him. Hey, listen, before we, what about Steven Gerrard at Villa, what he's doing there? He's Coutinho. done great. And he's signing Coutinho. Is he? They've signed Coutinho. I didn't know that. <laughs> Coutinho's at Villa. That's a great signing. Great signing. And what did they pay for him? I don't know. It might be a loan signing. Even better. I, w- I was worried about him taking the Villa job because I had it down in my head that he took the Rangers job to learn his trade, knowing every year had a 50-50 chance. Of winning the league. As, and as soon as Klopp steps down, he's a shoe in And when he took the Villa job, I thought, if you have a disaster, that might screw up your Liverpool chance. And, and I thought, that is the balls of you to do that mm. because... He could have stayed at Rangers until Klopp left, yeah. which we know will probably be three to five years, and that job would be his. He, he, on a plate, we'd all love him to come and do it, and we'd give him a chance. And I thought the Villa was a big risk, and well, I really hope he gets it's, it. He's he's got it right so far. Yeah, he's, t- his team's played good football. Mm. Might get him at Pifford. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> One day you might have to get him on the way down. Yeah, but there'll be someone. There'll be like you know, I, I don't know. There'll be some former Liverpool player who's in his late thirties who has not got a gig, who needs a gig, and I bet you could. I, I, I'm you trying to need think of someone, the right manager for you the know, league. Dietmar Haman or something. I know he's probably too old, but you know what I mean. Somebody. St- Stevenage recently got who was it? Was it Tim Sherwood in? Oh yeah, what a great big name to come around. You the, the Spurs, the guy yeah. sent him in. Yeah. Sure, it's Tim. Sh- no, was it Tim? Not Tim Sherwood. Teddy Sheringham. Oh, did they? Because he's from there. Yeah, I think he's from that neck of the woods. It didn't work out. Too old? Well, I just don't think you know that division. If you've played all your football in the Premier League and then you're going to go and manage a league... Oh, he went to manage them? Yeah. Oh, okay. I thought thought you were saying to play for it. And I think that's the point. It's like, somebody says to me, who do you want to be the manager of your... like?" I love sharing. He's a great player. Yeah, I love them. Ignore ignore your current managers. If you're going to get a new manager in, who do you want? I'm like, I want somebody who's won my division. So they understand my division. Okay. I think... Okay, but but... I go back to my point of I know, don't, I know. don't all players, even like, you know, Gary Big Bollocks from Real Madrid, he's had to he's at some stage actually maybe they haven't. Maybe they've just come through the academies and they haven't really got their knees dirty in a way that a lower league player would has. Hmm. I don't know. Hmm. Well, it's going to be a roller coaster. Yeah, it's fantastic. Do you want to do you want to talk some more or do we do we feel like I we've think come we to covered a- everything? Anything else you've not I mean, no, like no, I said, no. I mean, it's an ongoing. Um, why don't I come on in six months? Oh, I've got one question for you. Yeah. I know you're. You've got a big tour of the US coming up, uh, recording a lot of podcasts. Yes. How are you going to? Have you done that after the season's over? No. So, th- I mean, this is the challenge. It's like, how do I balance both things? Because uh, we went out and just did a two week sprint, recorded a load of shows, and what was great is my team is able to get them prepared and published because. I've done nothing but football for the last four weeks. Okay. But we're running out of shows, so I'm going off. And so what happens is I leave, and then my chief executive, he takes over the running of the club. We're going to have an hour call every day, update me, and then I'm back into show him over two weeks. I record those shows, and I come back, and I go football mode. This is the way I've got to do it. I've got to flip between the two. I can't do it in any other way, and uh, it's going to be interesting balance. I've got you. Do your... It's not Vanderbilt. What's his bloody name? But do your thinking, contemplating quiet decision making mm. you're going to make a huge success of this thank and you. i congratulate you peter thank you man. on your ambition and your dreaming and on your loyalty to bedford and where you've come from and your roots and on the way you are marrying all these things together the imagination that you've shown and the way you know most people don't realize their dreams and you're doing that and so I congratulate you. Thank you, man. You're making me blush. No, thank you. And thank you for agreeing to do this, like coming out of your way and doing this um, and helping me with this. And uh, thanks for agreeing to come down on Saturday. I'm going to tell Tom and he's going to be very excited. Anytime. So if we're interested in finding out more about Real Bedford, about buying a shirt, uh, about donating, about sponsoring, about possibly investing, what do we do? Yeah, go to www.railbedford.com uh, on Instagram and Twitter. We're at Rail Bedford, and uh, just but just note like the team we've acquired or agreed to acquire is Bedford FC. They've got a separate website, so if you're trying to find the table of the fixtures, it's on there. It's a bit confusing for now, 
by the end of the season, at the end of the se- you can't change name mid season. The season ends in May. Yeah, you can't change name mid season. So at the end of the season, we will we'll be changing the name. And uh, there is actually also already. <laughs> this is a funny thing. And sign up to the newsletter. There's already a Rail Bedford. You're kidding? No. So we found out. So I've approached them and offered them like uh, some support and facilities and uh, to allow what us. What do they do? Are they just like a local there are five Sunday like li- Sunday League Division Five team. And uh, <laughs> do they care or? No, no, no. He's like, uh, he, he said that he can have the name. And I said, look, I'll help support you and support your team as well. And thank you. Um, but you can't have two teams with the same name, even if it's Sunday League. And I just like, can you believe it? There is a Ray or Bedford. That's so funny. But, uh, but anyway, thanks for this. Appreciate this. Man. My pleasure.